Ten years ago, Andrew Fastow, former CFO of Enron, was indicted on 78 counts of fraud, money laundering, and conspiracy. Liquidation of the company followed very quickly after Enron's Chapter 11 filing in 2001, resulting in the elimination of 4,000 jobs, the loss of nearly $2 billion in employee pension value, and the evaporation of more than $70 billion in shareholder market value. Enron was not the only casualty. One of the oldest and most respected accounting firms in the country, Arthur Anderson, was also destroyed in the process. In addition, Enron's downfall and the other notorious business scandals of the early part of the decade ushered in the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation that imposed additional financial and regulatory requirements on companies large and small. The decade of fraud and conspiracy perpetrated by Enron resulted in huge costs to employees, shareholders, service providers, and to society as a whole. After 10 years, it seems appropriate to ask, what have we gotten in return? What lessons have we learned from this infamous episode in American business history? Has the way business operates changed in response to this experience? How can we avoid such disasters in the future? I'm Dan Sweeney, the director of the Institute for Enterprise Ethics at the Daniels College of Business here on the University of Denver campus. One of the goals of the Institute is to develop and share new knowledge about corporate behavior and business ethics. To this end, we have gathered ex several experts from the Daniels faculty and the Den Denver business community to explore what lessons we may have learned from the Enron era. Barbara Kreisman is the Associate Dean of the Daniels College of Business, responsible for executive and professional MBA programs. Dr. Kreisman has an extensive business background in human resources in a variety of companies in the technology industry and earned a PhD in organizational behavior from the University of Texas at Austin. Jim Burton is the managing partner for the Denver office of Grant Thornton, one of the six public accounting firms operating on a global basis. Jim has served Grant Thornton in a number of leadership positions and in a number of domestic and international markets over his 23 years with the firm. Cindy Fukami is a professor in the Department of Management at the Daniels College of Business. Professor Fukami researches and teaches in the areas of human resource management, employee commitment, and organizational behavior. Robbie Gilmore is a CPA and former CFO of several companies. Mr. Gilmore now serves as an independent director for three public companies, where he serves as chairman of the board or as chairman of the audit committee. Hugh Grove is a professor in the School of Accountancy at the Daniels College of Business. Professor Grove studies and teaches in the areas of accounting fraud and corporate governance and is co-chair of the annual corporate governance workshop at the European Institute for Advanced Studies and Management in Brussels, Belgium. Dave Cox is the Assistant Dean for Full-Time MBA Programs and Senior Lecturer in the Ryman School of Finance in the Daniels College of Business. Professor Cox is an expert in corporate finance, corporate governance, and ethics and professionalism in finance. We will ask these experts four questions about the legacy of the Enron era scandals. First, what are the principal lessons for the business community, business regulators, and society in general provided by the Enron episode. Second, how have these lessons changed the way business executives, corporations, and their boards operate over the past 10 years? Third, could this episode have been avoided with better governance, oversight, or regulation, or was it simply a function of the culture of business at the time? And finally, what remains to be done to fully exploit the lessons learned from this episode in the history of American business? Here's what our panel had to say. What I'd like to talk about is the fact that I was um, an employee of Dell Computer Corporation at that time. And I was also working on my doctorate at the University of Texas at Austin during the years leading up to the Enron uh, debacle and for a couple of years thereafter. 
My role within Dell was to hire high-level executives for the organization. And I had been there for 10 years prior to the 2000s. And we all were experiencing the sudden wealth, the um, exponential growth of the company, the um, increase in value of our stock options. And what I noted at that time was what was happening to people in general in the work environment. Being a student also in organizational behavior at the University of Texas, I came into contact with some of the same professors that were teaching the EMBA and the MBA students at the University of Texas. Many of those individuals were being recruited by Enron. Some were also being uh, recruited by Dell, but we were seeking more of the engineering talent than we were the business students. It was, um, it was well known then that very few universities were teaching ethics in their academic programs. And the University of Texas was little exception. They did have one professor, and his class was an optional course for the MBA students. And I remember him saying after, um, after the um, information about Enron began to break, how few students actually opted to take the ethics course. Now what we're seeing is a tremendous emphasis on ethics in our academic curriculum. Um, here at the Daniels College of Business, it is a foundation course and it's expected for every single student. I've seen many um, universities change their curriculum um, in favor of trying to build this moral fiber back into the psyche of the individuals that are graduating from the academic programs. I think in order to do that, though, people really need to understand what um, tempts them, what motivates them, what the long-range outcomes might be, um, and not to become so focused on immediate wealth and sort of a greedy perspective of what can be obtained in the corporate world. Well, at the time the Enron episode occurred at the turn of the century, there were a number of accounting scandals that occurred. There was Enron, Delphia, WorldCom, HealthSouth, and all of them had a common trait. The drive for success, the drive for profits, the drive for growth, all resulted in unsustainable situations for each of those companies. And as a result, what ended up happening was they looked to accounting as a way to continue that growth, to continue that success, and to deliver the profits that were expected. And in the, so from a regulator perspective, from a business community perspective, when profit and growth and success becomes the expected mandate, what'll happen a lot is if that's not sustainable, people will continue to look to accomplish it in a number of ways, including ways that we wouldn't approve of as a society. Well, I think there's at least three important lessons that come out of the Enron experience. The first is the importance of transparency. Uh, transparency in terms of openness of information, what's available to various people. Um, I think it's really critical that uh, transparency is part of corporate governance. Of course, there are regulations by the SEC about things that cannot be discussed in a publicly traded company, but I think we fall far short of, of those regulations in our normal behavior. So transparency needs to be encouraged. Uh, the second lesson has to do with toxic corporate cultures. Uh, we really disregard, I think, how uh, much of an influence a corporate culture has on our own individual behavior. We like to believe that we would never do something that we know in our heart is wrong. We do it all the time. All we need is uh, an environment that aids and abets inappropriate behavior. Um, this is largely the work of uh, Professor Philip Zimbardo, the Stanford social psychologist, uh, reported in his book, The Lucifer Effect. Uh, the third lesson, I think, has to do with the reward system. If you ever observe behavior that you think is inappropriate or unusual or surprising to you, a good way of diagnosing the source of that behavior is to look at what be behavior was rewarded. Rewarded behavior is repeated. Behavior that is punished is avoided. 
And I think we have to look very seriously at reward and incentive systems in companies that encourage, uh, even if it's um, uh, something that we're not really aware of and, and, uh, and aren't doing deliberately, um, we can inadvertently be rewarding the wrong behavior. Dan, I think Enron is a, is a lesson in behavior, and it's a, a lesson in principled behavior. I look at it from the perspective of someone who's been a financial officer of a number of corporations, and I'm currently a member of the board of directors of several public corporations. And as I look back on the situation, what strikes me the most is that the individuals that were engaged in the behavior there were motivated by personal gain. I don't think they took the time to stand back and look at how their behavior was actually uh, going to be judged, would be judged, or even if it should be judged. And it's only really through the benefit of hindsight that we, that we look at what happened. The individuals thought, in, from all indications, that they were in compliance with rules. Uh, there were accounting rules, there were regulatory rules, there were even court governance uh, rules within their own um, corporate body. As a consequence, I think that they believed that they were complying entirely with the rules. And by not standing back and considering the principles that were at stake and whether what they were doing was morally right, not necessarily just legally right, it created the opportunity for the problem to evolve. I think one of the things that, that most uh, companies have come to realize and most in, investor groups have come to realize is the importance of independent directors. I think you have to have someone who is not part of the day-to-day -day management team. You have to have someone who is, is watching and really focused on the best interest of the shareholders as you go into the decision-making process that a company goes through. So I think what, what most companies have, have picked up on is the importance of that outside director and the opinion that they can bring. Too many companies in the past have also relied on, um, for lack of a better word, a celebrity type of director that brings a, a, a big name and, and some connections. And, and while that can be very important, I think instead what you really need is someone who is really focused on trying to uh, ensure that the company is operating at its highest level is engaged in ethical behavior uh, and is performing to the, to the best of its ability. I think the principal lessons learned that there are both non-financial and fraudulent red flags to detect fraud, earnings management, financial shenanigans, manipulations, whatever you want to call it. And let me go into the non-financial red flags first. And here's a quote from Sir David Tweedy, who was the chair of the International Accounting Standards Board. And he said, the scandals we've seen in recent years are also attributed to uh, accounting, although, in fact, I think the US cases are corporate governance scandals involving fraud. And I, I would also say we've studied in our research Parmalat in Italy and uh, Satyam in Asia, and their nicknames are Europe's Enron and Asia's Enron, respectively, and I think these same red flags apply some of these big international frauds, too. My experience in the corporate world is that it has changed dramatically from an environment where people were very competitive with one another, almost cannibalized one another, to much more of a collaborative type of env environment today. Still there is the emphasis on short-term results, but I think organizations are looking at longer-term results as well. The organization I was with during the 1990s, very, very successful organization, um, our style there was to bring in people that weren't always in agreement with one another. Um, our leader had individuals that um, served as his advisors. They were maybe 40, 50 years older than he was at the time. And he balanced his executive staff with people whom were controversial. 
He said that if you are the smartest person in the room, then you need to find another room. And he liked that kind of pushback. From my knowledge of what was happening inside of Enron, that was not the case. And people were afraid to speak up. And at least 15% of the population was overturned on a six-month basis. And their bids were taken to give one another um, positive feedback in 360 feedback review sessions. Now that doesn't make for a, an environment where people are telling the truth about leadership or to leadership. And I think that the dynamics hopefully has, have changed somewhat today. Well, it's a funny thing about uh, control systems. We use a lot of control systems in organizations to try and affect behavior. Um, we also use regulations like Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, the fact of the matter is that when we imposed control on people from the outside, what we really get is people who get more clever at how to behave in the same old way while still uh, falling within the bounds of the new regulations or the new control systems. Uh, so I do think that uh, we haven't come nearly as far as we could in uh, these kinds of, uh, in regulating these kinds of behaviors. The most uh, important and the most effective controls come from inside the person. And so until we have created corporate cultures, where people not only believe that these are the right things to do, but that are supported through corporate culture, will we see any kind of significant behavioral changes? Well, I think that in order to understand what's changed is we should look at the history of what occurred. The frauds that occurred in the early 2000s were mostly accounting-based frauds. Right after, companies really focused on the process controls, the transaction controls. Are there approvals for all the transactions? Did all the transactions that are accounted for in the books and records actually exist? Those process controls have improved over those 10 years. But as we saw in the late 2007 and 2008 financial crisis, tone at the top and the governance controls really drive the behaviors of the people underneath and within the organization. And so while the process controls and the transaction controls have operated and have improved, What's occurred is the behaviors of the individuals at those companies has changed. If you look at the statistics, there have been less accounting-based frauds that have occurred in the late 2000s than occurred earlier in that decade. And so therefore, the tone at the top is really what's driving the behaviors of the people in the organization and creates an environment that will either condone the frauds or prevent the frauds from occurring. Um, Dan, there's really two answers to that question. Um, the short answer is yes, absolutely. There's a, a whole new set of laws, rules, and regulations that corporations must adhere to. Uh, we've certainly seen uh, things like 404 auditor um, attestation for internal controls. We've seen uh, companies having to beef up documentation and implement testing controls. We've seen certifications by CEOs and CFOs, and all of that is regulatory driven. But to me, the real essence of your question um, harkens back to the point of the first question, and that is, have uh, governance issues changed as a matter of principle? And do rules really uh, allow people to uh, operate differently um, if they're unprincipled? And in my view, one of the things that's happened with this uh, uh, significantly greater burden that's placed on corporations is that we've really set up uh, too many rules. And too many rules means that there are seams that if somebody chooses to misbehave that they can still do that. And in fact, in some respects, makes it easier. Uh, so I do think uh, that on a case-by-case -case basis, if a corporation behaved at a highly principled level, good corporate governance, um, they did it before, they're doing it now. Um, the burden that's been placed as a result of these additional regulatory requirements um, I think is very questionable whether the cost of that compliance is generating any significant benefit for the public's interest. Change the way they do business? I think most companies have uh, changed how they approach the decision-making process. I think that a reliance on, on boards is, is showing up not just from 
the way companies select who comes onto the board. But if you watch the organizations that engage in self-regulatory practices like the New York Stock Exchange and so on, what you'll see is a growth in their requirements that we have these independent directors, uh, especially on critical committees around compensation, uh, the audit committee and so on. Having them part of the audit committee has been, been pretty standard practice, but to have them in on some of the critical day-to-day -day functions is important as well. I would say that this was primarily a sign of the times. It was a cultural issue. Those of us that had been in the corporate environment throughout the 1990s, in the, in the high-tech environment in particular, we saw what quick wealth was doing to people. And it often left what I would say was a hole in one's soul, that the money would come, but the values would often go. Um, the values that were touted at Enron had to do with being bold, being innovative, being um, aggressive, being assertive, but none of their values, at least those that we ever heard about, had to do with ethical character or ethical behavior. Um, we know that people were just waiting for their stock to vest, and when the stock did vest, they thought that it would change their lives. And it wasn't unreasonable for people to expect that because they saw it happening all around them. And I think Texas, California was probably, um, they were both environments where that was happening and there was no reason for people to think any differently with Enron. The difference with Enron though was that they were dealing in commodities. They weren't dealing with a tangible product. So the people that were there were tasked with thinking about how to do business differently. And unfortunately, some became more creative than what they should have at the time. All the regulations in the world at that time probably would not have made a difference and, and didn't. Well, I think if we look at Enron, I'm not so sure that better structure, better culture, or better regulation would have prevented such a fraud from occurring. Clearly, Enron was operating outside the bounds of what would be normally expected. But when you think about what regulation does and what guidelines do, is they create an expected set of standards for people to follow. And the leaders within those organizations set the tone for determining how that organization is going to follow those guidelines and follow within those ex expectations. So by themselves, regulation, governance, and guidelines would not necessarily have stopped or prevented the Enron from occurring. I think if you're really going to have a structure that prevents fraud from occurring, you need leaders with fortitude to call out and step forward and live and, and drive the behaviors of their organization. So I think most businesses uh, never approach their decision making in a situation where they think fraud is the right way to engage with their shareholders uh, and with the business community. So I hope it's not a part of, of business culture at any time in our history. As we know, companies that engage in fraud uh, are never long-term successful. They may enjoy some very short-run success, um, but, but it's not sustainable and it, and it will come to light over time. I think what we um, are looking at at the, at the time was uh, a very over-regulated industry, a company that had uh, a lot of name prestige. Um, there were awards being given to the company for how they managed their company and how they treated their people and, and so on. And yet they were also engaged in fraudulent activity. I think that the, the processes that have come to, to uh, fruition since that time have, while many companies really resisted Sarbanes-Oxley and others, I think one of the things it has done is focus companies on the internal process that they need to engage in uh, in order to make sure that they can catch these types of uh, activities and behavior. Well, I'd like to believe that this was a one-off occurrence, but I think the, the activities in the subprime lending situation in 2008 are just another example of the same phenomenon. And that is uh, we 
inadvertently and maybe sometimes very deliberately reward this kind of behavior in companies uh, that take a very competitive stance in the marketplace. So how could we have avoided it? Well, you know, history shows that we haven't been very good at avoiding uh, these kinds of situations. We put together a set of regulations, some very smart people figure out what we can do to get around these regulations. And once again, if it's a behavior that's rewarded either by the company or by the, the system, it will be repeated. So our history is one um, replete with examples of people pushing the envelope. Um, I would hope that um, situations like this can be avoided in the future. <clears throat> Dan, I think uh, the problem at uh, Enron was really one of culture. Um, and it really starts with, I think, the most important principle for any corporation, and that is the tone at the top. Uh, the board was not actively engaged, the CEO was not actively engaged, nor was the CFO actively engaged, as we've come to learn, in ensuring that uh, the moral compass of the corporation was on track. Rather, there was a culture of stock benefits, um, personal gain, um, motivating uh, people to take over markets and, and really do negative things to their customers, all to, the, all to the benefit of the corporation. Anytime you set that kind of tone at the top, it creates an opportunity um, for bad behavior. And I think that's what we saw in this case. No amount of regulation, in my view, and no amount of uh, governance without an, uh, the appropriate tone at the top measure is going to um, prevent this type of activity from occurring. Subsequent to the Enron uh, debacle, what we've seen are other corporations that have had likewise um, bad tone at the top and they've engaged in bad behaviors. Um, I think that demonstrates that adding regulation doesn't necessarily change corporate behavior. Uh, if I was uh, going to create a future world, first and foremost, it would be one that's based on collaboration, not on commitment. Um, there are numerous uh, historical studies that have showed that civilizations that not only prosper but also survive at the very least are those that are built on collaboration and not on competition. I think we see these kinds of really outrageous and egregious behaviors when we're behaving in a competitive system. Of course we always have a bit of concern about collaboration and does that mean socialism and and do we want to lose the benefits of the free market. I think we have to find a nice uh, golden mean between the virtues of a competitive market and the, the virtues of collaboration. If we can work together, I think we can create a much more successful environment for everyone. I'd also like to see companies take a really long and hard look at their reward systems. Make sure that we're rewarding the kind of behavior that we hope that we will get from our employees. You know, if you called a, a customer service number recently and found yourself being sold additional services rather than being uh, satisfied with your complaint, you know that the company is rewarding people for selling you services, not for fixing your complaint. So the reward system is, is key in uh, producing the kind of organizational behavior we'd like to see. And last but not least, we, we have to continue to educate managers on ethical behavior. Uh, we do this as a matter of course at the Daniels College of Business. Uh, there are other schools that, that do emphasize ethics to some level. But more than that, we have to teach our, our managers how to act upon what they know is the right thing to do and how to create cultures where people are comfortable speaking truth to power and where transparency is the hallmark. So I think one of the, one of the places where we need to continue improving is around the transparency that companies have with their investors and with the public. I think that uh, all too often companies still engage in activity and, and disclosures 
that are only what's required and not what is necessary to really provide a complete picture of what's going on at the company. So I think that sometimes what we do is we get guided a little bit too much by what our lawyers tell us is permissible and what is actually the right thing to be doing. So I think that transparency is one of the places where we need to continue to improve and, and move ahead. A second thing that is important, and I think we do this uh, at Daniels, is I think more and more people need to be prepared to stand up when they know that there's something going on that's not right and say, this isn't the way we should be doing business. I think that one of the things we try to focus on is developing and practicing the moral courage to stand up when you know something's not going well and say, I think we need to look at this again. I think this is wrong. Um, we've got names for this, this process that are sometimes a little derogatory. Nobody wants to be known as a whistleblower and, and all, but that type of, of ability to stand up and say, we're doing the wrong thing is something that more and more people need to be able to uh, engage in and need to have the courage to be able to stand up and do. Uh, and sometimes it just takes practice to be able to do that. And so I'm pretty proud of the way we handle that here at Daniels. I think it's absolutely imperative that we teach leadership and ethical behavior in our business schools. The Daniels College of Business is one that does do that and we are noted for doing it. Students come from all over the world, basically, to take part in our curriculum. And they do so because they know that they're going to get more than just a business background here. We focus on leadership, we focus on ethical behavior, we focus on execution. We also obviously focus on the business technical skills, but when a person wraps all of those things together and layers them on a foundation of ethics, we know that we are creating business leaders that are focused on success that may be defined in a way differently than was during the 1990s or the early 2000s. We encourage our students to define success in a manner that makes a difference not only to themselves but to their business partners, their organizations, to the community as a whole. What we want them to do is to realize that the responsibility of business leaders is also to make a difference in the community. If we were focused entirely on the monetary value of success, that would not be the outcome. But it is here at Daniels, and we believe that we are transforming people and the communities as a whole with the behaviors that we tout in the classroom and have the students demonstrate during the time they are students with us. Dan, I think uh, some of the, uh, I'll start small and go big, uh, I think some of the regulatory steps have been taken and it, I would be remiss not to acknowledge that there are some benefits to some of the new rules. In particular, um, increased independence by board of directors which does encourage uh, more oversight and better governance. Um, knowing that the auditors are watchdogging internal controls, uh, no question has influenced the behavior of some corporations. Um, there's a point on that I'll come back to at the end of this, however, because I'm not sure that the actual mechanism is as effective as it could be. So there is a place for regulation. There is a, a place for, um, if you will, policing behavior to a certain degree. But I think that um, the real motivator here is really allowing shareholders to say more on how their businesses are run. Um, they need to be much more active, much more engaged. Uh, we've seen the rise of uh, uh, shareholder watchdog groups like ISS, which are starting to garner up some influence, but in effect, I think that what that does is it abdicates oversight to a third-party group, and the shareholders themselves are not necessarily engaged. That's what I think we need is actual shareholder engagement. Um, that can be done informally and it can be done formally. I think when you combine all of those things and there's the downside, when things fail, the penalties could be more severe. And I do think that the carrot and the stick methodology does work. But I do want to circle back to the point that I touched on a moment ago about the effectiveness of some of the mechanisms. Um, one of the things that gets a lot of attention and has uh, increased the cost of doing business significantly 
is the attestation of internal controls. And when one understands the details of how corporations are actually doing compliance or so-called SOX, Sarbanes-Oxley uh, compliance and internal control testing, um, what I think most people don't realize is that this is very, very limited. They take teeny, teeny samples, not even statistically valid, to ensure the presence of a control. It doesn't necessarily indicate that you can rely on that control. So we spend huge amounts of money and huge amounts of effort um, trying to come up with a certification that actually doesn't effectively test the way controls work. Again, it points out that the regulatory environment doesn't necessarily always win. Principles always win, in my view. Well, the lessons that have been learned from the Enron scandal and the other issues that occurred in American business at the time have been incorporated into the programs of many universities and professional organizations. The situations have been studied. The factors that existed have been evaluated. And I think what needs to occur next is all of those organizations need to come together and bring their, le their lessons and their learnings together to try to identify what were the factors and what were the situations that existed at that point in time that caused those companies to take the behaviors and the tracks that they did. Are there financial and non-financial factors? Are there expectations put out by the market? And how do both those specific and indirect indicators provide the environment for fraud to occur? And I think if we can do a better job of identifying when the environment is right, we can do a much better job of preventing it from occurring.